so I will give maybe a very brief and fast presentation about Giraffe, perhaps, to, for everybody to have to be on board. So to, otherwise, the presentation about Spinner won't make completely sense, or you can't appreciate it. Uh, so you get a combo of two papers today, actually nearly three. Well, if you, if you really will, because there is a paper about Giraffe, and it's an open source implementation, the same as Hadoop MapReduce uh, of another Google technology, in the case of MapReduce, it's still called MapReduce. In the case of Giraffe, it's called Pregel. So you get, you get those two papers plus mine. Uh, all right, so first, first brief uh, introduction about what Giraffe is. Uh, this is me. We can, uh, I am uh, one of the members of the Apache Giraffe project since the beginning. I got my PhD on distributed systems from Amsterdam and I work now at, at Google. I used to be a graph fetishist, um, now I don't work with graphs so much anymore, but here we go. So what is the problem of Giraffe? Well, the, what is the problem that Giraffe tried to solve? Um, you can think of, I think the Pregel, Pregel as a paper as a system for large-scale graph processing came out in 2012 when, uh, well, neural networks were not a big thing, so people were still caring about something else that wasn't machine learning, and graphs were a big thing, we had the web, we had Facebook, you had social graphs. So graph was an interesting way of getting insights by analyze, analyzing connected data. Uh, however, what was lacking is a, a set of technologies to, well, analyze large-scale graphs. There was an ecosystem of graph databases for storing graphs and, and running short queries. Uh, that is interactive queries, something that you would search for, I don't know, what is all the cities where I personally have been, or what are all the act all the movies where Brad Pitt star is an actor of and take place in Italy, so very local to the graph. But it wouldn't be a way to run large-scale analytics in the sense of what is the page rank of all the pages in the world, or what is the ranking of all the influencers in Twitter, or something like this, right? Where you want to uh, crunch the whole graph for a long amount of time. So there are many different systems, uh, like I said, uh, and many of these algorithms are, are based on iterative, many of the graph algorithms are based on iterative computations. And so basically Giraffe, and I, I will get into the API, targets uh, iterative computations, which many graphs are under the, those paradigms, uh, for offline analytics, so something that you would run for hours on a large scale graph, so no, no, not something that you would run to back up uh, an interactive application behind uh, the back end of a web, of web application. And it has to be scalable because the graph is so big that it can't, you can't store it in one machine. So these are the four main specs, if you will, to design Giraffe uh, and Mimpregel. Uh, this is a book we wrote about it. Uh, so the first point to understand, because often when I talk about Giraffe, people bring up, as happened also tonight, Neo4j and other graph databases. So let's take the space of big data into type of workloads and type of uh, model, data model. So let, let, let's simplify and make it discrete. We can have tuples similar to a relational database and usually an interactive workloads, like I said, something that you would expect to return in a few milliseconds, whereas you have analytics, so hours, and you can have as data model graphs. So giraffe stand here where you would run an analytical workload on a specific data model as a graph. So Neo4j would be somewhere here. Uh, and MapReduce will be here because it's about tuples, but it's not about graphs, right? So why, um, so what is so special about graph processing that we need a particular system to process graphs? Well, think about this. Uh, we have a vertex. This means nothing. If I show you this, you haven't learned anything about the world. Well, maybe you have learned that there is one thing, but that's it. Uh, if I show you this graph about Mark, it tells you that uh, Mark, loves Anna, he works for Banana, and he lives in Berlin. And uh, we, if I add some new information about Berlin, I actually, even if it's not connected to Mark. Well, what I found out is that Mark lives in Germany, right? So the fact that the definition of a particular vertex depend on the definition of its neighbors recursively, and recursively because then you can find out about Germany, other things with the whatever, the prime minister and so on and so forth. So you, you basically, every, everything is, is, is embedded and, and you can define and is recursively defined. Now, because 
we know that recursive algorithms can be implemented, uh, can be solved by iterative algorithms. Um, we have um, we have designed Giraffe such that uh, you can implement effect efficiently iterative algorithms. The problem was that the existing solutions for iterative algorithms, namely MapReduce in 2012, is very I.O. effect, is very I.O. inefficient because everything runs on disk. That's what MapReduce assumes, that you have to go over the graph multiple times and write a lot of disk, a lot of data on disk just to read it in the next iteration. So what Giraffe does it to begin with is store everything in memory and distribute it across multiple machines. But before we get into the architecture, let me introduce you to the vertex-centric paradigm. So the MapReduce paradigm is not surprisingly based around the paradigm of having a mapper function or a reduce function, where mapper receives a key and a value, and the reduce receives a key and a group of values with that key. The vertex-centric paradigm follows uh, a paradigm where you have one, where, where everything is a vertex, and you have a vertex-centric paradigm. So you describe an algorithm from, from the perspective of being a vertex that has some outgoing edges with some values attached to them. A vertex has a value, and in a number of consequent iterations, a vertex can send uh, a message to the neighbor, actually not even to any vertex with an ID. And at the next iteration, this vertex will receive in, 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 in its inbox the messages sent to that vertex. So it's very simple. You just write one function uh, that's called, we will see, that's called compute uh, with the ID of the vertex and the number of messages assigned, sent to that vertex in the previous iteration and the value associated to that vertex at that point. So if we take, for example, a graph like this and we want to compute what is the distance of every node, every vertex in the graph from the source one. So we want to have a value, number of hops, a weighted hops in, uh, associated to each vertex. How do we do that with this vertex paradigm? Well, we get, like I said, we have, you have to implement this compute interface, but that gets a vertex that has an integer value associated to it, the short distance and a number of messages sent to it. So what you do is you go over all the messages. If the message coming from your neighbor with his distance from the source is shorter than what you think it is, so far you replace, replace that. Otherwise, you just ignore it and you don't do anything. Uh, this is what it does. It, it, it assigns to itself a distance, uh, yes, a distance that is smaller and then propagates its new distance to its neighbor by taking into account the edge that connects this vertex to the next example. So at the beginning, this, the whole graph, the whole vertices don't do anything except for the source. The source sends a message that's saying zero plus one, zero plus two, because that's their distance. Uh, so now these guys say like, okay, I'm one and two. Two, one is smaller than infinity, so I will assign this value to me. Two is smaller than infinity, so I assign this value to me. So now I send one plus the weight three, one plus the three, the weight four, and so on and so forth. So we propagate these distances. Uh, so now this guy knows that he's four distances based on the edge weights. And this guy now knows the distance. They propagate this one. And he thinks now he's a distance of six. But now, which is based on this path, right, two, four, four, six. But now a new message will come in the next iteration coming from four that says you're actually one plus three plus two, which is five. So this vertex is like, oh, actually, is it four? What is it for? Oh, because it's actually this path, sorry. Two plus one plus one plus four. So he discovered a new distance. And uh, now all vertices don't have any messages more to send around. So there's no messages ongoing in the, in the system. So we can finish the computation and every vertex now knows how far it is. So with a bunch of 10 lines of code, we can run this on billions of edges. So the way computation in Giraffe works is you have a loading phase where the graph is loaded into memory across all the hundreds of thousands of machines. Each machine has assigned to it a bunch of vertices randomly shuffled uh, around the, along the workers. And then you have, because it's an iterative computation, you have these three stages until the whole computation is finished where you go over all the vertices, you compute the compute method, you, 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 you fetch the messages produced, you send it to the other workers, and then you go to the next iterations where you pass the, the messages to the vertices and so on and so forth. And this is asynchronous, which means that every worker goes over all the vertices and then every worker waits until the other workers are finished and then you go to the next iteration. So it's asynchronous, every vertex gets computed at most once 
before all the others get there. A sequence would be that the vertices would get executed at all times in an unpredictable uh, schedule. The, the model on which Giraffe and Bregel are built is called the bulk synchronous model, which is very simple. Uh, but you take a problem, you divide it in a number of pieces, you get these pieces divided among, among some processing units, they compute the intermediate values, they exchange them after a synchronization better, and they go on, so, so they, they go on, so on and so forth by updating these intermediate values until they finish the computation. And you can see how the giraffe model follows this theoretical model uh, of concurrency and, and parallel systems where the vertices are, are, are our data that the processing units hold in memory, the messages are the intermediate state that is shared between the processing units, and well, the, the synchronization barrier is a synchronization barrier. Giraffe runs on Hadoop, which means that um, you can run Giraffe in the same way you would run a MapReduce job. Uh, so you have a master worker architecture. There is one master that orchestrates the computation and there is, that doesn't store vertices. And then there is a bunch of workers that have a number of threads, have a number of vertices assigned to each of these workers and manage the inbox and outbox. And the workers communicate with each other without passing through the master via Nethi by exchanging messages. And the master is also via Zookeeper responsible of the synchronization barrier. So when all the workers have finished processing all their vertices and have sent all the messages, they wait until the master says like, okay, all the other workers are finished, you can start the next iteration. So this makes it extremely scalable. It's also fault tolerant because the master can die and you can have multiple masters that get elected by majority voting. Zookeeper is scalable because you can have, it's a replicated architecture and the worker is the same, a uh, worker can die. Periodically the workers at that a user-defined parameter can uh, shuffle all their state to the Hadoop file system. So imagine that after 10 iterations, you want to checkpoint your state, you just write all the vertices and all the messages that are ongoing, and then at any time a worker dies, another worker can start and get that state. Because it's synchronous, it's very easy and deterministic the way you restart from failure. Uh, so what is the advantages of Giraffe? Uh, it's iterative in nature, so you don't uh, overcoming cost of I.O. Well, because it uh, uh, assuming that you can store the whole thing in, in memory, although there is some ways of storing par partially your graph or your messages in on disk. You have a very simple API. You just need to think about vertices being uh, able to send and receive messages. And um, it plays well with Hadoop. Uh, and um, yeah, it's a it's scalable, distributed, and fault tolerant. In fact, a lot of Facebook is the major contributor to, to Giraffe, and they have a graph team that, that develops it and, and runs many of these jobs. Uh, so this pretty much concludes the introduction about Giraffe. If you have any questions about the, this thing works, how the way this thing works, I'll, I would take it now. Uh, so then we can move to my work on, on partitioning. Any questions? Where can you try this out? You go to the Apache page of Giraffe, giraffe.apache.org. You can download it. And if you have a Hadoop cluster, you can deploy on there. There is no, there is some form of shared state. That's a good question. I haven't gone into the details. For, for the situations where you need some form of shared state, for example, imagine you want to average a value across all the graphs, there is something called an aggregator which basically is another API you can define a message to send to the aggregator and this aggregator is a centralized way of taking these values and aggregating them as long as the operation is commutative. And uh, it's actually, while it is centralized, it is, it is implemented distributedly. So each worker first does the aggregation of each worker and then the master aggregates the values from the workers. So it's kind of a tree-based uh, parallel algorithm, yes. Um, what is the mapping between servers and uh, vertices stored in Zookeeper? Or That's a good question, uh, which brings me to, to the to, to, to spinner. Right now, by default, for simplicity, you take the ID and you hash it by the number of workers, and then you assign it. So if your ID domain is fair, it's going to be random. Right. Next quick. Yeah, so that's, that's what my work does. I'm going to explain in a moment. Yeah. 
<coughs> what results are computed? How is support for and still guaranteed? If they don't, they don't want to see. Oh no, so it's all done. Okay. So no, 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 no. I, I'm trying to understand the question. It's, so the end of the computation is, you can think of it as a big map by default, where you have the ID of the vertex and the value assigned to the vertex. For example, the ID of, of the vertex before and its distance from the source, right? So at the, end of the, at the end of the computation, the workers flash the data to HDFS or something like that, and uh, you will have a big text file or whatever you upload or whatever you, you use. And during computation, it's something kind of similar, but you add a build that in, together with the current value and ID, you will have probably the messages as well. So you have two stores, which are just big files on the GFS with the messages with the source and the destination. I guess if you're going to come to it in the second part, but what kinds of workloads are really hard to locally split per worker? So are there any kind of kinds of graphs that are really hard to? Right. I guess now. Right. No, I, I mean I. Uh, Okay, so there are, two, there are two answers to this question. The first answer to the question is because the graphs are difficult to partition. Uh, regular graphs are difficult to partition. Imagine a lattice, like a grid. They all have, except for the borders of the lattice, they all have four neighbors and they're all, it's regular, so there's no partition. If you look at it, there, there's no way to do it. Uh, luckily, there are a few of those graphs. Uh, social networks are, and they're scale-free and small world and so on and so forth. Uh, with respect to difficult to compute is dense graphs. So graphs that have many, many edges will produce many, many messages and this, this will produce uh, a bottleneck. Effectively, a giraffe system like this is um, bottlenecked by the I.O. over the disk and I will get to it because the graph partitioning tackles that. Another question? Yeah, that's that's another good question. So I, I've simplified a little bit the paradigm for the sake of simplicity. What happens actually is that every vertex has a state. It's either is an, 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 an active or an, in, an inactive state. And every vertex starts with an inactive state and turns automatically into active state when it receives a message. And then it can vote to, to go into the inactive state or vote to halt the computation. So the whole computation stops when every vertex has voted to halt and without going, right? So in the case of the previous example of the shortest path, if I find it, you can think of it here. The vertices indeed, what they do is they send a message and then they vote to halt, right? So they, that's why the next iteration, this vertex is not executed because it's in halted state and doesn't have any messages that are going. So this, as, as a wave of messages come through, the vertices are woken up, they process data, and then they wake up the next ones until you get here. Everybody has voted to halt. They don't have any outgoing messages, so on and so forth. In a situation algorithm like PageRank, where every message, every vertex is sending a message at all times, they don't vote to halt. You have an external coordinator that looks at, through an aggregator, that looks at the rate at change of the page values. So when you see convergence, like the page rank values of each vertex is not changing from one iteration to the other, you just stop it abruptly. Yeah? So just to, I have a little plug. So this is a book we wrote about it. I give it for free to the person who answers this question. So the first person who answers this question, and if you wanted to use this paradigm and you wanted to compute the number of components, or the, the let's say the number of components or the the idea of the component a particular vertex belongs to. So a component is, imagine you have this graph, you remove these edges, so you have a component with these three vertices, and you have a component with these five vertices. And we don't know that ahead, of course, and imagine that the, ed there are, the edges are going in both directions. We want to find out that there are the two components, and each of these vertex has to know, has to have to add a value assigned to each vertex, right? Because they belong to the same component. How would you implement this in, in Pregel? Very different from the shortest path. Right, you, you, you would start by having a, so the only data you have is, for example, the ID. You, you would start by using the IDs. Yeah. No, you, at, at, the beginning of, at the beginning of the competition, all vertices are active. You probably can find the smallest number in each component. 
perfect. So the, the vertex does, what this vertex does is it emits its, its ID to the neighbors, it checks whether the, the ID that it's coming in is smaller than their own, and every component, every vertex in a component acquires the value of the vertex in the component with the smallest ID. That's it. So at the end you will have, I don't know, assume, assume that these are IDs, these will, they, will, they will have zero, they will all have, well, I'm, I'm actually, not, I cannot assume IDs because they're not these, but imagine these are the smallest ID, they will all have the ID of this one, right? So that's the way you do it. This is yours, you can take it now or later. Uh, okay, so let's go to Spinner. So Spinner is the work we present we 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 presented uh, in 2017 to the International Conference on Data Engineering (ICD). It was in collaboration with Dionysius Locotetis, Locotetis, who is also author of the book, and his works on Facebook on, in the graph team that works on Giraffe. Uh, and you will see why this is relevant in a moment. You can also see that this presentation is following the layout of Facebook. While I work at Google, the reason is that. He's presented it, I don't have any connection with it. We're recording on YouTube, so I should clarify that. It looks awkward. Um, so this is the presentation. What is, what is the motivation? Motivation is that uh, in 2017, graph management was, is, is basically defined between online and offline graph analysis and patterns. So you have, either you have a database where you store data and you have queries for an interactive workload, or if you have analytics workloads, uh, you have system, systems that do both usually two different systems, and you have very large data sets uh, that don't fit in one particular machine, right? So the question is, is, how do you do that? Well, you need to take this vertex, and some, in both cases, what, whether it is for online or, or, or offline analysis, you need to split your graph across multiple machines, right? In, when you go on Facebook and you just want to, know, to see the list of your friends, probably the data is, is, there, is, is shorter across multiple machines. So we will take a use case. So it's, it is important to assign vertices to shards, to, to workers in a way that is efficient. And we will get to a definition of efficient in a moment. Uh, whether it is for interactive or online uh, workloads, or if it is for offline uh, also, off uh, workloads, um, you, you can think of it, the approaches being very similar. But we take here as an approach for a graph partitioning algorithm for the, the case of giraffe, okay? So um, we have, the approach is applicable to multiple workloads or multiple systems, but we here we focus on giraffe. So like, we, you, know, you know all about giraffe now, it's a vertex-technic vertex approach uh, where vertices have state and they exchange messages. Uh, there you go. And under the hood, giraffe is charted, but while you as a programmer, you think on the vertex, you think as if all the graph is in one machine, actually we are distributed across multiple machines, right? Uh, right, so what is, the, what is the problem? When you shard uniformly at random your vertices, what happens is, is this. First of all, you produce a lot of traffic, right? So every time you send a message to another vertex who is on another machine, you have to serialize the message, send it over the network, deserialize it, and so on and so forth. When you shard, your graph by assigning a vertex to a machine at random, basically all your messages will go over the network, right? Because the chances are 99.9999% that a vertex will be on another machine. This is why giraffe is um, IO bound, and in particular network bound. The second problem is that it consumes more memory than it could be necessary. Imagine that I have a message that I'm sending to my three neighbors, and these neighbors are stored on the same machine. What I can do is I can send the reference to those three messages to my neighbors, and they can, because it's read, the messages are read only, I don't have to have three copies of the same messages. The reference is enough. Whereas if I send the message to these three neighbors, and these neighbors are in three different machines, I have to copy them. So if you think about the whole cluster, the, 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 the usage of, of, of memory is higher. So if we are able to put vertices local to each other by a, a definition of locality on the same machine, I avoid sending a message over the network and I avoid duplicating messages. And third, if I do it very well, I want that each worker to finish its, his shard of work 
uh, it has to take the same amount of time so that the workers are not idling. So I want to have the same number of workers, or, or same number of vertices, or even better, the same number of edges assigned to each worker. So that in, you know, in all complexity, uh, they have the same, the same uh, complexity. Uh, all right, so what is, so graph, the problem of the, the spinner is trying to solve is what is called uh, balanced k-way partitioning. So we try to take a graph and we're trying to divide it in k partitions and we're trying to make it in a way that is balanced such that each partition has the name the same number of edges because the way giraffe works is competition is proportional to the number of edges and when I say edges I mean I want to assign vertices to shards such, such, such that if I sum all the edges to the vertices assigned to that uh, to those vertices they are the same. I cannot split, put some edges of my vertex on this machine and some edges of the same vertex on another machine, right? So I want to put vertices in a way that the total sum of edges on each worker is the same. Uh, so what is, uh, what is the, so what spinner, spinner tries to do is try to effectively map vertices to partitions as a mapping function uh, such that a loss function is, uh, is minimized or maximized depending on, depending on the definition. The first is in particular for spinner we have a uh, a, a loss function that has two terms. One that is trying to map the quality of the partitioning and the quality of the partitioning means that we want to have a small number of edge cuts. An edge cut is an edge that connects two vertices assigned to two different machines. And the second term is, uh, that we, is, is the fact that the, each partition should have the same number of edges. But equally important is that the partitioning needs to be adaptive. Imagine that I take one trillion edges like the Facebook graph and I spend a day computing my partitioning. And then in the next week, I have all the people playing on Facebook, removing and adding friendship, joining things, sending messages, and I want to have, I need to process these vertices, but this, the graph has changed. Where am I, where am, where, where, let's, let's imagine I'm adding vertices. Where am I putting these vertices? I cannot, well, what I can do naively is I just start from scratch. I take the graph. Assign them randomly and are repartitioning, which of course you don't want to do because it's very inefficient. So it would be rather be better if you take the old partitioning, you add this new data, you press a button, and it just has some cost uh, proportional to the new data you have added. So it has to be adaptive to change. It has to be practical, which means you don't want to build a new system to do partitioning. Like when Giraffe came in, the, 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 the state of the art was something called Metis that would run on a shared memory high performance computing, which Facebook didn't want to invest because they have a, well, I don't know why they wanted to invest, but you wouldn't want to invest when you have a Hadoop cluster. Why would you have one particular supercomputer just to partition your graph? Uh, why don't you use Hadoop to do that as well? And it has to be scalable, of course, because the graph is large. So the cool thing about Spinner, the way it solves it is, well, we will see how Spinner does it. It's practical because Giraffe, Spinner is an algorithm for Giraffe on top of Giraffe and the output of the algorithm, algorithm can be used by a giraffe instead of the hash partitioning to run uh, efficiently other algorithms. And scalable comes for free by being in a, um, a, a giraffe-based or Pregel-based computation. Uh, all right, there you go. So this is a spinning algorithm, spinner algorithm. Spinner algorithm is based on a general algorithm called labor propagation. Okay. Label propagation works as follows. Each vertex at the beginning has assigned at random a, a color. Imagine that you want to have k partitions, you will have k colors, and we assign them to vertices at random. See how this is gonna go. Uh, vertex computes a score for each label or each color, and, uh, and that depends on the number with that same color. Similar to the way we were assigning a component ID depending on the component of the neighbors, a vertex will take the color of the highest scoring label, which is when we're all trying to optimize. This is actually only label propagation, not spinner. So to that community, what you do is you just start like that, and the vertices take the color of the, that is more frequent across the neighbors, and you do this iteratively. Now all these guys, you can imagine, now green, green, and so on and so forth, everybody will be green. And, uh, but this is based only, and this, this, this means that the algorithm 
is scalable because every vertex can make a decision based only on local information. So you just need to know what your neighbors because I can I can partition I, I can parallelize my computation at the vertex level granularity because you don't need to have some way of centralizing any computation. Now the question is, you can do this for to partition a graph. I, like I said, I can have five different colors if I want five different partitions, but vertices will tend to all have the same color to maximize only my locality uh, term of the loss function. So what we do is we add a, the term for capacity where partitions are characterized by the current load, which is the number of edges assigned to it, right? So let me see if I, we have, oh, no, we don't have a, a formula for it, for it. But what you do is you try, your, the loss functions try to maximize the locality, but at the same time maximize the load. So if, I, if everybody gets green, we will have a vertex, a partition with, let's say, to, for, to simplify, with eight vertices and other four partitions with zero vertices, so it will not be a great function, a loss function. But in this case, it, will choose, it can choose another color effect, uh, later on such that we have maybe three greens, uh, two yellows, and two blues, which still kind of increase the locality because the neighbors are maximized, but you also have the, the balance of, of the vertices across the partitions. Uh, which I actually shows here. So you'd rather choose yellow than green, and now you have a more balanced partition, although the blue is dangling. So the way we implemented it is we implemented it as part of giraffe. Um, it's based, well, this is actually explaining only what giraffe does. Uh, the way we do the load capacity is, is, is what we, we make use of those aggregators. So whereas you can do the, 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 the term each vertex can compute its core by looking at um, by looking at its uh, at a number of neighbors with a particular color. We still need to have a form of aggregating per partition information. So we use aggregators to count the number of edges assigned to them. So vertices take the labels coming from the neighboring vertices. They count the labels to compute the score, and they take the aggregators and say, like, okay, if I do this, the partitions will change in load in this way, and this is the score. So what they do is exactly what I just described. They, they tell what, what color they have, they choose it, they propagate, and they continue. What is the problem? The problem is that because it's synchronous, imagine in a situation like this, and these guys wanted to maximize their locality, he would pick green, and he would pick green too, because they are deciding at the same time independently. So what happens is the, the, those guys, they're most likely going to turn green, right? That's, that's because the, 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 the model is synchronous. We will see the outcome of their decisions only after the iteration is finished. So what we did instead, integration in steps. So each of these vertices will make a decision. They, they say, like, I would like to be green. And he says, I would like to be green too. But not, not both can do that. So instead, it was like, okay, I would like to do that. I have flip a coin, and if it's with certain probability, I will actually get, go and do it. Whereas the, uh, and each of them does that. And this makes sure that not everybody can does, does, does the same action at the same time. So this guy gets green. This guy would like to do it, but he doesn't do it. Let's say 50-50 chances. The next iteration, this guy sees that they, they're both green, and he will go for blue, because the decision of going blue maximizes balance. Uh, the balance term of the of, of the loss function, right? So we evaluated. We we went to evaluate this algorithm uh, in a number of ways. First, we wanted, for sure, of course, we want to see the quality of of the partitioning. How how good is is the loss function? How how, how much we can minimize or maximize the loss function when we run it on real graphs? The second thing is how scalable is it? If I run, if I add additional machines. Will it run faster? The third aspect is once I compute the partitioning and apply it to giraffe to assign the vertices to the workers, and then I run another algorithm like page rank, how much faster does it go because it, does it, because it has less load to less data to send over the network? And the third, the, the other aspect is, of course, uh, how much does it take to adapt one particular, uh, to a particular, a particular graph, right? Uh, 
as opposed to, for example, restarting it from scratch. So we took a bunch of graphs, and we, we started by seeing how, the, how, how partition scales in number of partitions. So we started taking the same graph and increase the number of partitions exponentially. And we, took, we did it on a number of graphs. We took the live journal graph. This, is, I think, has something like 4 million vertices. Then we went to the 20 graph, which is a Spanish social network, 20 million vertices. Then we have a Twitter graph, who was, I think, 40 million vertices. The Yahoo graph at that time, who was 1.5, 1.3 billion vertices. We took the whole Facebook graph, which had around 1 trillion edges, 1.5 billion edges. This was the Instagram graph which we, we can't say how big it was because I think it's still secret, but in 2017 more, more so, but let's say they, they rank correctly. Uh, I guess. Uh, if you look at the, this is the, basically the, the rate of improvement compared to, uh, to shared, uh, sorry, to, to hash partitioning. Uh, well, this is, you can see that when you divide it by, in two, so this is actually the, the edge cut, sorry, this is the edge cut. So basically, if you divide it in two, it's much easier to, to, to decrease the, the number of edge cuts, right? The more partitions you have, the more it's difficult because, well, you're split in the graph, so there have to be more edges. Uh, and, well, this is, uh, this is exponentially, so. So you can see that certain graphs are more difficult to partition, for example, and this is, I think, the Twitter graph. The reason why the Twitter graph is, so is more difficult is also because they have these super nodes kind of thing, uh, that we have, we have vertices that are connected to many other vertices, and they're also more dense. People tend to have very many followers, compared to Facebook, for example, or a, web, website. a website has, I think, around six edges. Facebook, maybe what do you have, 250 friends, whereas the number of followers are much higher, so it's more difficult to partition by decreasing the edge cuts. And, uh, but yeah, but if you look at a Facebook graph, it's actually one of the ones that get highest level of locality. So even if it's so massive, uh, because, uh, because you don't have this kind of influencer kind of thing in Facebook where everybody's connected to Lady Gaga, but you have friends connected to themselves. So you have this locality and, and scalable and scale distribution of, of clusters. Uh, it scales very easily or more, let's say easier. Uh, yeah, this is the comparison with hash partition. You can get up to 300 improvement compared to hash partition, actually. Yeah, because also hash partitioning actually decreases drastically in inequality when you increase the number of partitions. This is 300 times. Uh, then this is 300%. It is what is written, I don't remember. So this is 300% of improvement. No, 300, oh, yeah, I guess three times. Is it? Yeah, maybe three times. Yeah. 